Hi, I'm Max Spain Allen. And I'm Troy McCormick. Welcome to Indiana Outdoor Adventures. Welcome to Indiana Outdoor Adventures. Today we're in Indianapolis for the Red Bull Trail Marathon, co-sponsored by Dino, Do Indiana Outdoors. And today's exciting race, uh, we're here in the middle of December, we've had snow flurries, temperatures in the, you know, around 25 degrees. But what's interesting about today's race is the runners will all take off on the same trail, but four tenths of a mile down the way, they're gonna hit a place where the trail splits into three and they have to make a choice. At that point, they can take the long and easy route, they can take the intermediate route, or they can take the shorter, more difficult route. It's going to be interesting to see how many take which course for today's race, because they're all going to end up back here at the start line for the finish. Let's go check in with the beginning of the race and see how things get going today at the Red Bull Trail Days. While our runners uh, run around and get warmed up and get ready for the race, let me just tell you a little bit about where we are today. We're on the west side of Indianapolis, Indiana at Eagle Creek Park and Reservoir. Now, what most people don't know is this is one of the largest municipal parks in the United States. There's over 1,300 acres of water, almost 4,000 acres of land. They've got a nature center. They have hiking trails, picnicking, uh, all kinds of activities. It's an amazing little uh, uh, park that we have right here. There's wildlife galore. There's a lot of bird watching deer alongside the roads. It's a great place to come and visit uh, just for a Saturday, Sunday afternoon kind of a thing. But with the activities come things like the Red Bull Trail Days. Once owned by J.K. Lilly of the Eli Lilly Company, the land was given to Purdue University in the late 1950s. The university later sold the land to the city of Indianapolis to create a public park. And when a large earthen dam was built to control flooding, miraculously, we had Eagle Creek Reservoir as we know it today. Now, it's easy to forget while we're out here in the park that we're only 10 minutes from the downtown area of the 12th largest city in the country. Joining us now is Joel Feinberg, and Joel is with Red Bull, our sponsor of the Red Bull Trail Days. Joel, what would you think of the race? It was great. Three, uh, three courses, everybody had a blast. Uh, you know, some tough sections on all the courses, but uh, I think at the end of the day, they uh, achieved what uh, we set forth, which was three great courses, everybody having a good time. Now, tell me what your position is with Red Bull and with this particular uh, race. Uh, I'm the project manager for Red Bull Trail Days. Um, actually created the event while I uh, worked at Red Bull um, and uh, uh, I came back to help them run the event and deliver it and we run it in both Chicago and Indianapolis. Yeah, I know we've ha I've had a lot of the runners talk about it. They're glad that it's here, hoping that it's going to be here next year. They've had a good time. The, yeah. the snow quit for us so we had nice temperature today. Yeah. Uh, the race seemed like a little challenging. Was it your idea to do this uh, run for four tenths of a mile and then got to choose easy, medium, hard? Yeah, I mean, it was one of those things where, uh, you know, in fine Red Bull fashion, it's how do you take something that, you know, has kind of been done and throw it upside on its head, 
but yet still, you know, keep the values of the brand. And so, sure enough, we created Rebel Trail Days where you get to a certain point where you have to pick what trail you want to go. So everybody starts together, everybody finishes together, but in the middle, it all depends on what course you want to take. And, and, and you've got this slow, or the easy, medium, and difficult. Yep. Now, I, I didn't go road. out and, and walk all the trails. I walked a couple of them. How difficult was the difficult? Uh, it was fairly difficult. I had a couple drop-offs um, down, kind of into the ravine a little bit. Then you'd climb back up on the embankment of the Eagle Creek. Okay. Um, and then you actually run alongside the embankment. So the, you know, it was actually the soft ground made for better yeah. footing. Yeah. But you'd hope that, you know, with the ice and the... Because so. we, we were down there where the, all the trails were converging and they had to run across the bridge, the Willow Wood Bridge, and yeah. make the little leap off of it. And it was a little slippery, I think, first thing this morning. Yeah. So I, I liked that because everybody had a little bit of a challenge, even if they took the easy route. Right. Well, I mean, we couldn't have done this without our without uh, the help of the Dino guys. You know, Brian at Dino, he knows these trails the back of his hand, and he's he laid them out. I told him, you know, what we needed to happen and he came up with the trails that you know made it happen so we couldn't have done it without the the Dino guys and and all the great work that they do for mountain biking and running great well I know we've enjoyed the race today we really appreciate you uh, being here in Indiana yeah. and uh, maybe we'll see you next Love time yeah definitely great next year 2012 stay tuned we'll be right back with more Indiana Outdoor Adventures here at White House Whitetails after 20 years of growing trophy bucks we have developed a product called Buck Bullets, a hybrid supplement. Buck Bullets is not only designed to be an excellent attractant, but also a fully loaded supplement to improve antler growth and health of your deer herd. It can be used in your backyard wooded area or in your hunting area. You too can add at least 10 to 20 inches of antler to bucks in your hunting area the first year with Buck Bullets fully loaded hybrid supplement. Cave Country Canoes, located in the heart of Indiana's cave country, offers a variety of canoe rental trips from half-day outings for beginners to two-day adventures for the more experienced enthusiast. Our canoe trips follow the gently meandering Blue River through the wooded hills of southern Indiana. Abundant wildlife and great fishing opportunities abound. Go to cavecountrycanoes.com for more information about our canoe and kayak trips. Your next adventure is just a paddle away. Hillbilly Custom Game Calls offering the finest and precision-made diaphragm mouth calls for wild turkey hunting. Each call is handmade and gauge-stretched for exact tension each and every time. Select from double and triple reed calls like you've never heard before. We also have an assortment of handmade wood box calls, glass and slate top pot calls, and predator calls that will make us your source for all of your custom game call needs. Look for us online at www.hillbillygamecalls.com. Follow Indiana Outdoor Adventures online with Facebook, Twitter, and our website. Stay up to date with our exciting adventures as we're out in the field filming and meeting new people. From news updates and announcements to Twitter posts by co-host Troy McCormick. Why wait until the next season of shows when you can follow us as we're filming them? Join us online to get the most current news on Indiana Outdoor Adventures. Choice ahead! Welcome back to Indiana Outdoor Adventures. Today we've got an interesting and exciting race in Eagle Creek Park, just outside of uh, Indianapolis, Indiana. The race today is rather unique because there's a choice to be made right in the middle of the race. The runners, after they get started, they run about four tenths of a mile, and then they come to a divergence in the trail. You either have to run to the slow trail which is the easy way you can take the medium route or you can take the shorter harder route now our runners here have begun to split up they're making their way through the woods they're on one of the three trails and they're all getting ready to come back uh, to where they'll finish up the race on the same part of the trail here comes our leader right now uh, in fact you can see number two position coming in uh, along the uh, trail in the background here the runners all converge back together here and start making their way toward the finish line. There he is now, our first place runner for the day, getting ready to cross the finish line. Mitch Stardusky, coming across the finish line, he will receive the winning prize today. He ran the hard course.
happen to be the fastest course today. Third place from Indianapolis, Derek Spear at 20.07. 20.07. Second place from New Augusta, Indiana, Martin Wilkie at 20 minutes flat. And taking the win today, the only person to break 20 minutes, Vincent Georgescu from Carmel, Indiana at 1942. And they all ran the short course today, the hard course. And they'll go home with a case of red gold and a pair of stock yeah. shoes. Yeah. Not bad. Yes. <laughs> Let's hear it for our top three men. All right, hey, guys, work great. Hey, you are. Yeah. Richard, you yeah. back to this guy for the actual oh, pair of shoes. You guys email Michael here and he's going to read the warrant and take out. And I chose a hard course today. I've done other trail races before, and I like the tricky, technical, difficult, uh, you know, paths. They're more fun to me, so that's why I chose hard. Plus, it was a little bit shorter, so I knew it was about three miles, and I knew that'd take me about 20 minutes, so I could kind of gauge how close I was to finish to pace myself and for the rest of my race strategy. It was you good. got first place. What was your time? I ran. Uh, I guess it was about three miles in 1945. 19 minutes, 45 seconds. And what was the course itself like? The course itself was, uh, well, the hard course that I ran. <clears throat> All trails, if not a lot of little bits uh, that were off trail, straight through plain woods uh, without any path. Trail, uh, lots of hills, not very good footing. <clears throat> and essentially we followed streamers, neon streamers that were tied to trees, tied to poles. Uh, and that's what marked our course for us. Great. Were you in the lead the whole time or were you following people? Uh, I started out in the lead and then when it came to the split where you chose medium, uh, hard or easy, <clears throat> uh, I chose hard and I guess a couple other guys followed me. So I was the first person to start the hard course and uh, I did stumble. I actually fell on my face for the first time in multiple years. Uh, the trail got me. But that's what made it fun. So that kind of put me back a little bit, still running with the same three pack of guys. We basically finished the, finish the race together. Sounds great. You going to do it again next year? I'd love to do it next year as long as it's here. I'll sign up. Great. Perfect time of year. School's out for me, so it's, it's perfect. It's good. Great. Well, congratulations. Love the thank you. Thank you. Brian, we've had quite a race today, and uh, Dino's been the major push to get this thing here. How did you entice Red Bull to bring the trail days here at Indiana? It actually went the other way. Oh, they really? contacted us because they knew that we were the experts on trail running in Indiana. So they came to us and they said, here's the idea. They had done it in Chicago last year and they wanted to do the same thing in another city and Indianapolis was one of their target cities. So we said, we're your people. So we helped them lay out the trail. We made all the coordinations with Eagle Creek Park and did everything necessary to make it happen. And we did everything we could to make sure it was a good event. And Eagle Creek Park made a, made a nice uh, central Indiana location for something like it's this. It's an extremely popular location in Indianapolis. A lot of people run here. A lot of people are used to coming here to run and do trail running events. So it's a good place to do a new event like this, get it started. We had what, 160, 170 racers? I think we were about 160 yeah. registered. Now, we, we were doing something new during this race too. We actually had uh, tracking chips, timer chips, or right. what, what do you would call those? Right. Yes, uh, we have used electronic timing. It's called chip timing. Chip timing. And it's done by, in this case, it was a tag that's worn on the shoe. Mm -hmm. And then when they come across the finish line, it will read their finish time. And we don't have to manually do that. It's done electronically. We also had an announcer information area where they about 10 seconds before they finished, we could read their name and announce who they were and where they were from and that kind of thing. So the, you had chip sensors before they got to the finish line. That's right. That allowed you to do that. Right. And then you had one that officially locked in their time as they crossed the finish line. That's right. That's and, and that's what was hidden under the blue mats. That's what the blue mat is for. <laughs> the blue mat is the reader for the electronic timing. So, right. And we, we looked at the chips and it was just something fastened to the shoelaces on the shoes. And, yes. And then they were able to uh, remove those at the in, end of the race. In this case, they're reusable. They attach to the shoes and they're taken off. And 
returned at the end of the race. Uh, with Dino, we are actually moving to a different type of chip timing. This one is one we're using temporarily. Next year, we're going to do one that is worn on the race number itself. So the runners don't have to do two steps. They wear the race number on their body, okay. and the chip is on that. That's good. So they won't have to put one on their foot. Now, for those that aren't familiar with Dino, I know we've been along and filmed some of your trail marathons and BMX races. Tell us a little bit about what Dino offers throughout the year. Well, Dino is an acronym for Do Indiana Off-Road. And what we put on are events that involve trail running, mountain biking, or some combination of those two. We also have an adventure race and a triathlon that's held off-road. So our running races range anywhere from a 5K length, and this race falls about that length, up to a trail marathon. And our mountain bike races are, have all different lengths and different ability levels as well. So we are the experts in Indiana on trail running and mountain bike events. Great. Well, I, th I think you've had an excellent event today, and uh, we've enjoyed being out here with you. So we'll see you in the Pleasure. woods and the trails next time. Great. Thank you. Wonderful. After serving our country, serious injury shouldn't prevent our veterans from enjoying life. Paralyzed Veterans of America works with veterans to ensure that their health care and benefit needs are met, provides assistance with career needs, and offers challenging and rewarding activities. The Kentucky and Indiana chapter of PVA is proud to provide adaptive sports for members that includes hunting, fishing, trap and skeet shooting, bowling, and billiards. Visit us online to learn more about Paralyzed Veterans of America. Sugar Camp Lodge offers some of Indiana's finest trophy deer and wild turkey hunting opportunities. We have 400 acres of woods, marshes, and farmland that provides amazing habitats to hunt. You'll enjoy great meals and accommodations in our beautifully remodeled 1850s lodge. Sugar Camp Lodge is available for meetings, get-togethers, and special occasions. Visit us online at www.sugarcamplodge.com for more information and to book your next hunting adventure. Looking for adventure? Marengo Cave has it all. Explore the underground wonders of Marengo Cave with our two easy walking tours or go on an adventurous cave exploring trip with hard hats and lots of mud. Kids will love discovering gemstones at the Cave Springs Mining Flume. This U.S. National Natural Landmark has been open to the public since 1883 and provides breathtaking views of underground cave formations. Visit us online at MarengoCave.com and plan your visit today. The Old Goat Trading Post in Bloomingdale, Indiana offers not only traditional fur hides, hats, and mountain man-like apparel, but beautifully crafted spirit hides. Artistically sculpted from elk, moose, deer, and buffalo hides, they are the perfect wall hanging for your home or vacation cabin. The shaved hair sculpture and original painted scenes combine to create a natural canvas and work of art. Visit www.oldgoattrading.com for more information. Let's venture down to Bedford, Indiana and check in with the Limestone Heritage Festival, an annual festival dedicated to the men and women that work the limestone, the artisans that sculpt and craft the statues and monuments and limestone building blocks that we see throughout the country. Now this annual festival draws people from all over Indiana to come watch some of these artisans uh, working their craft. And that's what we're going to do today. We're going to check in with these guys and watch a little bit of their magic that they work with the stone. Well, I'm a uh, stone cutter actually in the stone mill and I lied to my boss years ago. We, we used to, any stone carving that came through the mill, they would subcontract it out to one of the local stone carvers. And I told my boss one time when, when we had some stuff coming through, I said, I could, I, I could probably do that. He asked me if I'd done it before and I lied and said, oh yeah, that'd, that'd be easy. So I just kind of made it up as I went and uh, it, it turned out that it, I don't think it's as hard as stone cutting. Stone cutting, you have to be able to cut straight lines, uh, mold work, and stuff like that. With stone carving, anyone can cut a crooked line. I think the trick is, like, if you want to make something look real, like a leaf or anything, you have to you have to really cut a sharp edge on it and undercut it. And I think that that what separates the men from the boys to make something look like other. See, limestone lacks color. 
So you have to make, you have to, I call it cartooning. You have to make everything overemphasized. You, you know, without the color, you, get, you have the, to go shading which, and... Right, you, you really have to, like if you just do a regular leaf, you might see a, 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 an oak leaf and it may be almost flat. It, it's definitely flat when it's on the tree, when it's green. But what I will do is, is overemphasize all the, the veins in the leaf and make the edges razor sharp. Uh, the same with the acorns, if you're doing acorn clusters. Overemphasize everything. Make the, make the top of it even bigger than what it usually is so you can tell the difference between the top of the acorn or the, the cap and the acorn itself. So you're giving it depth and character, right. twists and turns, right. and making up for the lack of color exactly. through the nuances of shading and, and right. depth. And that's another thing. A lot of people will photograph limestone. They, they have a tour that comes through our stone mill on Thursdays. And uh, people will have their, their if, especially if we've got a nice piece that we're working on, mm -hmm. they'll use their cameras and take a, uh, leave their flash on and that completely whites out the stone. The way to photograph limestone, in my opinion, is to shine a light either from the bottom, from the side, from the top, in a, in a real high intensity light with the lights off everywhere else and it will really bring out the, 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 the texture, the depth, the character, I think. So during your normal job, you're a stone cutter. And, and, yeah. And today you're a stone carver. Right, now, uh, we, we're doing a job now, it's going to, I believe, it's Missouri somewhere, I think in St. Louis, it's a courthouse, and we did a, there were two medallions with Lady Liberty, not Liberty, Lady Justice, with the, with the, the, the blindfold the on, holding the scales and the, and the right. sword, and I, it, I think it's an inch and a half relief, but to me, like I say, I, I always found that very easy. I can't draw, but they will give me a photograph or a pattern, and all you have to do is trace the pattern, and then, and then everything in limestone is already there. Inside this right here is a, is a fish swimming, believe it or not. And what I'll do when I say there's a fish in here, I can't draw the fish, but the fish is already here. All I have to do is take all this extra out and I'll leave this fish. But you can't, if you want to just make a, a plain fish, you see you'll leave this square and draw your, your fish. What I do is I want my fish to have character to be swimming so it'll have a radius. So I'll cut this, I'll cut this radius right here all the way through and leave it attached to this base. And then once I get this side uh, concave and this side convex, I'll draw my fish on it with the tail and then cut that outline. I will leave only a, only probably a thumbprint with this fish attached to the base. And that's what makes it art really when you look at this piece you will think that there's no way you can cut a fish on a base without either breaking it or maybe that I glued it on there but I won't I will I will make it to where it is so one you, piece of stone you visualize it in your mind yes and I have to because I can't draw I can't even draw stick people but you, it, inter you internally it. see it in the stone yes. and cut away everything that shouldn't be there yes tell me about the tools that you use these tools are, uh, most of them are carbide. This one is not. This one is. The, some of these tools that I have are over a hundred years old. Uh, they used to be, and I've got a few at home, used to be they had a ball on this end and they had a wooden mallet. And I believe the mallet was made of some kind of cork wood, so really a dead, it didn't have any bounce to it. When you hit it, it just it was thudded. Solid. Right. They, my great uncle tells me, Uncle Garnet, tells me that they would take seven strokes and then one break. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and then a break, and then seven and a break. I've never used a mallet. I've used a hammer, and if I'm doing something real delicate, you can take a very small tool and then and, and another tool and tap on it, So that, because the air hammer is much more aggressive. Uh, we have a mechanic at the mill who makes, who doesn't make our tools, but he can take a shank like this, he can, he can uh, heat the tip up, make a radius, and, and I probably have six or seven hundred chisels, some of them duplicates, you know, but there's some of them that are just better than others. You can have two tools that look exactly alike and they'll cut completely different. different. Yeah, and then some tools like this, this tool here, and I don't know who the guy's name is, C. Period Taylor, wherever it came from, garage sale, auction, uh, it cuts better one way than than the other, and I don't know why that is. But, but one side of this chisel will cut better than the other side. 
besides the tailor sticking out cuts better. Huh. And I've got I've got a bunch of tools that belong. I've got one. Uh, I believe it's G. W. Gratzer, and he was one of the first uh, cutter carver industrialists here in Lawrence County. George, I believe it was George Gratzer. I've got a few of his uh, tools. I've got. Uh, uh, Jack Bush's tools, who's the grandfather of one of my friends who was a stone carver, and, and honestly, the chisels with names on them mean something. It's When I die, I don't want my chisels to sit in a basement or an attic. I want them to continue to, I think it, whoever this guy was, it, you know, his tool is still That's neat. creating it, art. It's, it's still pulling art out of stone. Exactly. exactly. Well, tell me how the air chisel works. Inside the air hammer, you can hear there's just a, a, a piston in here, and I believe it was at it was ni around 1900, 1907, when this took over the mallet. And all it is is air uh, is injected into the air hammer, and there's a piston inside, like a like a car piston that just goes in and out. And the the air comes in, makes the piston do its thing, and your exhaust is this hole right here. This air comes out this exhaust. And by throttling that, you can see the, the hole in my glove. If you throttle that, you can make it hit lighter. It will the, the, the vibration will be will will be very tiny. If you let go of that, the it, 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 the piston is allowed to move freely. And then I don't know how many hours I, I've been doing it. Actually, carving for about 15 years. So you've got an inherent skill you just kind of found. Did right. you have anybody tr teach you or train you? Or? I worked for six months with, with uh, Bill Galloway. And what Bill Galloway did for me was he really gave me... I, I always saw these stone carvers and thought, there's just no way. I saw the work that they did. And I, like I said before, I have no artistic ability. I can't draw. Uh, but I saw these beautiful things that they did. And working with Bill Galloway, I had to do it. He said, this is your piece. This is what it needs to look like. And if I had a question, I'd ask him. I worked for him for about six months, and he really turned the light on for me as far as gave me confidence. Thanks for joining us today. It's probably going to be a while before you see any big statues that I've built, but I sure had fun practicing on working the stone and trying out that air hammer. We'll see you next time, right here on Indiana Outdoor Adventures.